Duncan, who has been in the industry. I met her at, when we were buyers at Bergdorf Goodman over how long ago? I don't want to Many say. Many minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's been in the industry for over 20 years. She's worked with Barney's New York. She's worked with a top jewelry showroom in the US. And now she, which would basically have all the top brands. And then now she is consulting for many different brands. She has her own consulting business. Um, so she's currently in market. So I'm so glad to have her here. She also was really good at helping businesses that were B2B shift to more of a D2C blend of a model as well. She's helped many businesses with their websites, um, their social media aspect of it, and what is needed to create a true omni-channel um, business. So I'm really excited to have you here today because again, you're in market right now watching what's yeah. happened. So I, I cannot wait to hear from what you have to say. So I'll be quiet and let you Thank go. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and hello to everybody out there. Um, so excited to be here. Oops, Tara said the recording was stopped. I don't know if you meant to record or not record. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. Anyway, um, okay, so I will just jump right in and let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this now. Um, so, so yes, as Tara mentioned, I have been in the industry um, for many years. Um, I won't go into how many, but I've done, um, I've been lucky that I have both retail and wholesale experience. So I can really come to this um, with both perspectives about what small brands need and what buyers need and how small brands can fill those needs. Um, so, today is really just going to be um you know kind of a, an overview uh an introduction to the key market preparations for designers that want to target both their wholesale and their direct to consumer strategies um we'll really touch briefly on some of the key industry trends and the buying trends that i've personally seen come out of the recent spring summer 22 market um, before moving into the necessary steps to help you prepare for entering the international marketplace um, and today we're really just going to focus on pricing and assortment planning um, there's so much preparation that goes into it but um, at the end i'm going to go over the next um, few sessions that i'll be hosting and um, kind of dive into what will be covering then as well. So before we get into the key market preparations, it's really important to understand how this past year has affected the fashion industry. Um, as Tara said, this is probably going to be a bit repetitive to what you have already heard from in your earlier sessions today, but it's really important to reiterate um, as these key trends to emerge from the pandemic will really help shape both your wholesale and retail strategies going forward. Possibly the biggest change to come out of the past year is really the shift in consumer um, shopping behaviors. The pandemic has really dramatically changed the how, the what, the why of consumer shopping habits. Um, the how is really this unprecedented pivot towards digital. You know, everybody had to really think quickly on their feet um, in order to succeed over the past year. It really compounded the demand for all things digital, which in turn has enabled innovation, efficiency, and new ways for small businesses to scale up, um, which has been really great to see the innovation that has been coming out of this past year and how brands are um, presenting their collections um, virtually, um, you know, coming up with different ways to do that, um, which we will get into. Um, during the pandemic, people were spending an increasing amount of time on their phones um, and other devices. As a result of this, the e-commerce really um, just exploded. Um, everybody was shifting. If you didn't have a website, you built a website. This change is really here to stay. Um, it's not going anywhere. So it's really essential for brands to build a strong foundation, foundation now um, as the competition for discretionary spend will only increase as the world opens back up. You know, during the pandemic, um, the focus kind of shifted away from buying experiences to buying things. So, you know, as you couldn't go out, you couldn't travel, um, people still had moments to celebrate. So they were still buying products, um, especially products with value. 
So many retailers over the past year actually had really strong sales and performed really well, um, particularly in the jewelry, accessories, and home decor fields. Um, you know, as I said, people still had moments to celebrate, um, dress up, even if it's just from the waist up from Zoom, accessorize with your jewelry um, and spend more time at home. People redecorated more, um, spent more time on their immediate surroundings. As the world opens back up and consumers start to pay for travel and dining out and other experiences again, this is going to shift once again. Um, you know, the consumer's discretionary spend is going to get eaten up by that again. Um, but the brands um, and the stores that have built a really strong omni channel presence which is really creating this uniform online and in-store experience and built um, a loyal connection with their customers will really have the advantage. Another shift in consumer behavior is that shoppers are increasingly supportive of local businesses and smaller independent brands, um, which is really important to keep in mind. Um, this is particularly with discovery happening through Instagram. So social commerce, um, especially Instagram shopping, has made people more likely to buy based on product and less likely on brand name alone. So there's really a lot of opportunity for small brands to stand out here. Consumers are really happy to test a new brand if they offer the product, the features, and the style they are looking for. Um, so online opportunities like virtual shops that are accessible on social media platforms can really help small businesses gain a competitive edge in the marketplace. Other key industry trends to take into consideration um, include a shifting buying calendar. Um, as a result of the pandemic, supply and demand really shifted overnight. Many brands had to rethink their supply chain um, as different countries moved in and out of lockdowns. And this posed several challenges like sourcing your materials from various countries, production, shipping delays. Um, so as a result, many retailers adapted a, a buy now, wear now model for their customers. Um, and with Fashion Weeks moving to hybrid in person and digital formats, brands are really arriving at inventive ways to present their collections. Um, for, for me, for a designer I work with, this really came into play the past year because obviously our production was delayed. We, we showed late, the store pushed back their delivery. So we shipped at an off time, normally send, um, you know, the spring order would go out. Pandemic happened, we didn't ship until basically the end of the summer, nobody really send, launches new collections in August. That's usually a sale time, but we launched a new collection in August um, with net -Porte, a -Porte, um, great online um, brand. And we actually had one of our best seasons ever. So you can see that the, the buying calendar, both from a retailer buyer's perspective, as well as the consumer's perspective has really shifted um, throughout the past year. Um, another key trend is the shift towards more considered purchases. So really showcasing environmental credibility um, is increasingly becoming an important way to connect with consumers as they're demanding more sustainability and transparency from the brands and retailers that they shop with. It's increasingly becoming an imperative for future brand success. Um, there's a consumer survey that I saw that was conducted by um, the IBM Institute for Business Value that among more than 14,000 consumers um, in nine different countries revealed that, you know, worldwide, 76% of the correspondents said that sustainability is significantly important to them when choosing a brand. So we'll touch more on this as we get more into communicating your brand story and how that can come into play. Um, another key trend is consumer engagement and experience. So not only have businesses had to focus on increased efficiency for success, but also on providing an excellent customer experience. Relationships between brands and consumers need to be based on trust and enhanced communication. So this really applies to both your direct to consumer um, customers as well as your retailers. Um, the relationship always starts with the purchase of a product, no matter if it's a consumer or with a retailer, but it doesn't end there, which is really um, important to remember. It can be continued throughout the life cycle of the product, um, whether it's new product launches, um, training, Things, emails to check in, you know, 
calling the store manager to see how it's going. Um, maybe there's a customer loyalty program where if a um, customer buys X amount, you can offer an incentive. Um, there's also a way to do incentives with stores that, you know, during the holiday season, perhaps you can run um, an incentive for sales associates where if they heat, reach a certain threshold, they get, um, you know, a piece of your jewelry or, you know, a beautiful linen from your home collection. Um, so definitely communication, keeping in touch with um, your consumer, both retailers and stores has been really, really important. Um, so these are just a few of the key industry trends that will really help shape a brand's approach to successfully accessing the international market. Um, and I will be referring back to them um, as I continue through my sessions um, with examples to, to help you pinpoint how your market preparation and getting retail ready really does tie back to the key industry trends. So as I have gone through the spring summer 22 market, um, these are just some of the top buying trends and patterns that I have seen emerge. Again, number one is communication. Communication um, this past year has become essential. Um, you really want to take the time to talk to your clients um, and make sure that, you know, as a brand, you're supporting your retailers uh, throughout the season. Um, it's really become imperative. You want to build and create relationships through open and transparent dialogue. Be honest about your production delays. You know, ask how you can help your existing partners. Um, you know, if their budgets are tight um, and they're they're at least placing an order, can you offer some product on memo to round out the assortment? All these things can help build that relationship. Um, and it's a two-way street. You know, the retailers need to show that they're working with you and you need to show that you're supporting the retailers. Um, so all this helps to build a sense of community between brands and retailers. And then that translates over to your end consumer as well. Um, another trend I've seen is that buyers are really looking for new resources and brands to help them stand out um, in the competitive digital marketplace. Um, some buyers I've spoken to, you know, have noted when they come up um, and we start talking to each other that it's really important for new brands to know their market, um, who are they trying to reach, um, that brand relevance and price value are super important, um, and that the brand should be building its profile on social media, because this is how retailers are connecting with new brands. Um, again, I'm going to go into this in more detail in a future webinar, but this is why it's so important to keep your omni-channel strategy um, really clear and concise and make sure you, you have a consistent brand message because if you reach out to a store and they want to um, learn more about you, they're going to go to your Instagram, number one. Um, that's where they're going to go. So you need to make sure that you're clear and communicating visually um, what your brand is about. Um, another trend is um, market, so trade shows. Trade shows have looked a lot different um, in fall 2021 than previous years, um, but many are still taking place virtually and in person. Um, you know, as I mentioned, many stores, especially independent boutiques, fared really well over the past year. Um, so they're coming to these shows and they're approaching brands with intent to buy, which is really key. Um, and if buyers are not attending in-person shows, you know, there's still some source that they can't travel internationally or they're just not comfortable yet. Um, so they're still conducting virtual appointments. So there's still opportunity to connect with buyers um, virtually. You just have to be prepared um, on how you'll be presenting your collections virtually. Um, you know, for me, I was at two of the first trade shows that when they opened back up in August, um, I was at Couture, a jewelry trade show in Las Vegas um, and New York Now, um, which is in New York. And, you know, they were a lot, lot smaller than they have been in the past, um, you know, both in terms of exhibitors um, showing and buyers attending. But you know, they still ended up to be a success because the buyers that did come were coming with intent to buy um, and they were looking for new brands, something that will help them stand out um, to their customer because, you know, they're dealing, you know, I know as a small brand, you're probably dealing with um, increased competition in the digital space. So are the retailers. So, um, 
you know, it's a good thing to keep in mind that once the world starts opening up, if you can do a trade show, if you can do a virtual trade show, um, if not, there's still opportunity to do virtual appointments. Um, you know, there's still, there's still many opportunities to connect with buyers and retailers. Um, and as I have found, um, in smaller independent boutiques, I think um, have really seen the advantage from the past year because they have the customer, the loyal customer base. So um, we will also get into this in a future webinar, but when you start building your target store list, um, you know, maybe pay attention to smaller boutiques, really kind of focus on those rather than your bigger stores like a Neiman Marcus or a Nordstrom. Um, while those are great for your brand, um, and to help build awareness, I think that you're really going to see the impact um, with smaller boutiques that have fared well, um, have budgets, maybe not huge budgets, but they have budgets and they're willing to test new. Um, and finally, delivering faster than the competition. Uh, buyers understand the production delays and supply chain issues that everybody is faced with now. You know, at the trade shows, everyone said, I'm so excited for this order. When can I get it? You know, they all understand that, okay, I might, I'm here in August, I might not get this until like November or December, like, will I get it for holiday? Um, but, but if you have available inventory, they'll take it immediately. So I really think to account for any production delays you may be experiencing, um, if you can pre-order limited quantities to anticipate future sales and immediate delivery capabilities, this will really help give you the competitive edge. Um, I did this with um, a jewelry brand that I work with now. Um, our production was delayed for our new collection that we were supposed to launch back, launch back in June. Um, we actually just um, received the samples in in September and showed it in September. Um, but previous to this, we had been working and following along with the production delays. Um, that as soon as we received we received the first samples and we approved them, we placed a stock order. Um, anticipating stores we work with um, will be buying it. Now there is calculated risk with this. You have to make sure that you're doing this with stores you currently work with and that you know will be buying from you. Um, as it is, we overestimated, but um, we know that we can sell it on our website or we can you know, move it to other stores as well. Um, so if you have immediate stock, fabulous if you can pre-order a limited amount that would be great um, stores are taking things now um, which is really great so with these market and buying trends in mind we'll touch briefly on the importance of a combined omni-channel strategy so having a mix of both wholesale and retail is really key to the success um, of any small business whether you sell your products primarily online or if you just want to expand your reach, selling to retailers is a fantastic way to boost revenue, create brand awareness, and build that kind of network connections that you need to be successful growing a wholesale distribution business. With the focus on all things digital, having an online presence is really a crucial part of developing your strategy. You know, how are you reaching your consumer and selling to them, especially given the constraints we face today? How are you attracting your retailers? In order to be successful and remain competitive within the market, you need to have an online presence. You need to have an easy to navigate website, um, a clear and concise Instagram account, um, and this really targets both the direct to consumer audience um, as well as retailers. So, you know, it's a win-win. Some key benefits of focusing on a combined digital and wholesale um, wholesale and retail strategy um, are increased visibility. So by selling wholesale to boutiques, um, customers who've never heard about you before will come across your product. Um, and when they want your designs again, um, you know, in the future, or if they recommend you to others and they look you up, um, you know, they'll often probably just Google you and they'll come across your website or your Instagram. Um, so you have opportunities to grow your direct to consumer um, connections as well. Wider distribution. Uh, this is the same as what, you know, bigger companies do, you know, think of somebody like excuse me, in the US, like a Ralph Lauren or a Tory Burch, um, that they have many different um, avenues to their business. Um, and they sell to major retailers like Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom, but also through their own site and their own stores. 
Um, so by selling via retailers, you have a wider reach and audience for your products than through your website alone, which adds to greater visibility. Um, credibility, the majority of sales actually now start online um, with uh, just native Google searches or Instagram discoveries. Um, so having a fully functioning digital strategy with your website and social media telling the same brand story, um, this lends you credibility within the marketplace um, and helps to build trust with the consumer and retailers alike. Um, I know Tara mentioned that trust is something that has come up in previous sessions. So this is really important um, to help build that uh, relationship with the consumer. Um, a strong digital presence can really help small businesses increase um, flexibility, control, branding, and credibility. And then enhanced customer interaction. Um, retailers are really beginning to expect brands to provide them with the con convenience and consistency of an e-commerce operation, especially as travel for market appointments is still slow to get back to normal internationally. Um, it's really all happening online. If it's not in person, it's all happening online, especially internationally. So having this digital presence, not only you know, targets and reaches your direct to consumer, customer, it also offers a 24 seven online catalog that keeps retailers engaged um, and interested in products and you know how they can search for you in between their busy shows or market appointments um, and also helps to build hype around your products. So what do you need to cover in order to get your brand retail ready? Before attempting to sell your products, whether it's on your own website or it's to retailers, it's essential to have all your bases covered and make sure you're preparing for market efficiently. The, the next three we're kind of going to touch on here. I'm going to dive into the first two um, a lot more in um, upcoming sessions. Number one is research. This is the most important step. Um, it's to define who your target customer is. Um, as the customer sits at the center of your omni-channel strategy, it's really essential to identify who that customer is um, at the outset so that you can ensure that you're offering designs that are appealing and appropriate for their lifestyle. Then as you move through each stage of your market preparations, you can constantly keep them in mind and make sure that everything you're doing is appropriate for that audience. Knowing your customer will help narrow down and target the appropriate retailers for your brand as well. So I'm really going to get into this in my next webinar because it really is the number one most important thing and I need a lot of time to cover it. Um, so we'll really dive into how to define your target audience and what questions to ask yourself to focus your research. Branding. Um, it's important for designers to have a firm grasp of how their products will be marketed and how to create a captivating story to create a unique selling proposition, um, otherwise known as a USP. Uh, you want to create your brand story and plan on how you will communicate that story. It's one that will help you stand out amongst the competition. Um, again, <laughs> this is very important, so we'll get into this um, in another session, um, but it's really important to, to keep this in mind as we move along and understand that developing your brand story is a key element of any retail strategy. And then presenting a cohesive collection. Um, because stores aren't buying just one piece, they really want to see that your product line has a cohesive vision and voice. So before jumping into wholesale, it's really important to take an objective look at your line. Does it look like it was all made by the same person um, or are there too many or too few designs? In order to make your line more cohesive, you may need to cut some designs and expand others to create more choices. So now we'll kind of dive into this a little bit more and look at the first two steps to focus on when preparing for market outside of research, because that's really number one, but that is going to be my next session. Um, so here we're going to talk about um, assortment planning and pricing. Um, so really determining the number and types of products you'll be presenting and to establish your wholesale and suggested retail prices. 
So planning your collection assortment is really um, a very important essential step in building your retail strategy. Um, assortment planning in the age of e-commerce can be tricky, especially as retailers and brands want to remain competitive and not offer products that everybody else has. Um, so determining the ideal product mix and inventory breadth and depth um, setting your competitive prices, um, providing personalized experiences, um, and dealing with rapid, rapid lead times um, is really just kind of scratching the surface of what um, small businesses need to do. A helpful guide that I like to have designers follow um, when looking at their collections um, are what I call the four C's for a collection. Um, you want to keep it clear, concise, cohesive, and consistent. Um, so as you're going through and analyzing your assortment, um, you know, is it clear to your consumer what you're selling? Um, you know, can they really get an idea of your brand um, from your product mix? Um, are you consistent or are you all over the place and telling 100 different stories? Um, so things like this are really important to keep in mind as you go through your collections. Uh, use historical data pr to predict future assortment needs. Uh, look at last year's um, and season, past season's assortments um, and their performances will really help you set realistic targets for the upcoming season. Um, which product categories were winners? Um, what were the weak performers in the assortment mix um, in previous seasons? Um, this will really kind of help you tailor what to continue on with. Focus on your best sellers. Track your best selling products across all your channels. You know, are your direct to consumer um, best sellers the same as your retail partners best sellers? Analyze what sorts of products sell well each season across this competitive landscape. You know, this is a good point to keep in mind is that. You know, currently, if you're being affected by production delays, this is um, a good place to start that if you have to narrow your focus to your best selling silhouettes and categories, this will really help streamline your collection to ensure that you're you can still have a successful season. Um, you know, don't get bogged down by thinking you have to have, you know, 100 different products out there um, if you can't produce them. Um, if you're having production delays, kind of narrow your focus and focus on your best sellers um, to help you move through the season and then expand from there, depending on how it does. And finally, consider complementary items for cross merchandising. So when making assortment decisions, uh, you're not just planning on how to choose and present a collection of standalone items. It's also worth thinking about how different items in your assortment complement each other. Um, a perfect example I always like to bring up is um, there was a new up and coming jewelry designer I worked with. Um, when she came, it was when I was at the jewelry showroom in New York, when she came to us, she only had necklaces in her collection because she loved big statement necklaces. Maybe she had a few rings, um, but personally, she didn't wear earrings, and so she didn't make earrings. Um, but that's where you kind of have to look at your um, collection assortment and say, okay, what does well. Earrings happen to be the number one best-selling category in jewelry across the board. Um, so you have to make sure you're filling needs like that. Um, so it's really important um, to kind of take those things into account. Pricing. Um, it's so important to set your pricing accurately from the start. Um, make sure that you're building in wholesale price to your model. I cannot tell you how many brands I've seen that set retail prices, but fail to set a wholesale price and then they try to back into it later. Um, but this, this just doesn't work. Um, for a successful retail strategy, you really need to have all your bases covered and create a dual pricing strategy to ensure that you will still profit, um, regardless of whether you're selling your products you know, solely on your website um, or wholesale to retailers. There are two main areas to focus on for pricing your products. Um, the first is cost to wholesale. So your wholesale price should be the very lowest amount that you can sell your product where you can still make a profit. To ensure you are priced appropriately, you need to factor in all of your costs into your wholesale pricing. So your materials, your labor, shipping costs, um, and accounting for profit. Um, in general, a good place to start when setting your wholesale price is to multiply your cost of goods by two. Um, so this will ensure that your profit margin is at least 50%. 
Um, the next one is wholesale to retail. So most designers now put forward their suggested retail prices, um, otherwise known as MSRP, um, in order to main, um, maintain consistency across all avenues of the business, especially with the industry focus on our, all things digital right now. You want to make sure that your retail price is consistent. Um, so pay attention to your retail prices. Assess the level of difficulty or skill involved in making the design. You know, how easily can you recreate the design? Are the materials easy to source or are they limited? What is the perceived value of your product? This is a really important one. Um, you know, take a step back and look at your item and get a feel for how it fits into the market um, and analyze it from a consumer's viewpoint. What will your consume will what will the consumer in your target market be willing to pay for the items? Um, so this really goes back to knowing your customer um, and who your customer is, um, which we'll really dive into um, in the next session, as I mentioned before. And then pay attention to the marketplace. What prices are your competitors offering? Um, what price points are your ideal retailers selling at? Um, so it's really important to remain competitive and kind of take all these outside factors um, into account when you're establishing your pricing. This is a very, very, very super simple costing formula. Um, I always like to just throw it up here um, because it, it just gives you a general guideline. I'm not saying that it has to be this and you have to follow this. Um, again, it's very basic and depending on the product that you make, whether it's jewelry um, or home decor items, um, it will really vary. But in general, the wholesale to retail markup is usually between two to three times your wholesale price. Um, and the standard wholesale to retail markup in the fashion industry um, is generally Keystone, which is 2.0. Um, but again, depending on the product, can really range from 2.0 to 2.2 to 2.5 um, or greater. So again, I just want to throw this up because a lot of people ask this question. So just very super simple. Does everyone feel sick now? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is, yeah, um, a, a pricing worksheet. So a good practice to get into um, is to create a price worksheet to keep track of all the styles within a collection. Uh, you want to include as many details as you can. So the item skew, the material costs, labor costs, um, the date, because it's important to track by date um, because the cost of materials can fluctuate. Um, I know as market trends fluctuate. Um, so this is kind of a little bit hard to see, um, but you can always hopefully screenshot it and blow it up on your screen. But this just kind of shows a really general, this is for jewelry, just because um, these are the samples that I've worked on. Um, so you can kind of see that you have your gold price, um, silver price, casting price, labor, um, parts, finishing costs, all the costs that go into making these items. Um, and then add that all up and then you know play around with it and try different markups to see where you land at um, so this is from cost to wholesale so you know you can see here um, in the orange column this is um, with a 2.3 markup and then the blue column is 2.4 and then the green column is 2.5 so it could kind of play around and see um, where that gets your wholesale price um, and it's important to note that, that there's no set formula to price your products. Um, there should be a give and a take in your pricing strategy. Um, your general pricing structure should all balance out. You know, everything should be in line with each other in your collection. Um, so while there's certain guidelines to follow, it will really vary based on your skills, the type of product you make, and the material you use. Um, you know, there may be times that you make much more profit on a design and times that you might not make as much because you really want to price it competitively. Um, your core styles, the core best selling pieces in your collection should have a good profit margin, um, while maybe more um, one of kind or statement pieces might have less of a margin um, due to the labor involved in making that beautiful one of a kind piece. Um, and here's an example of a wholesale to retail markup spreadsheet. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges designers face when entering the international market is logistics. Um, international buyers really expect simple, easy shipping and receiving. 
meaning that the burden is on the designer to cover shipping, customs, and import duties. Um, so part of a developing a successful international sales strategy is overcoming this complexity on your end and making sure that buying from you is simple for your customers, no matter where they're located. Um, a helpful way to accomplish this um, or to you know kind of handle this is by establishing a landed cost. Um, landed cost is the total price of a product or shipment once it has arrived at a buyer's doorstep so it includes the original or the set wholesale price um, of the product that you have um, plus shipping as well as any additional fees such as import duties shipping insurance and other related costs so you can see here on this example um, Again, sorry, it's just jewelry because that's the samples I, I've worked on. Um, you can see here we have clearly laid out um, the style number, item description, an image for reference, um, and then you have the unit price, which is the their designer's base wholesale price, and then landed price, which is what um, the wholesale price is for international retailers so that um, shipping and customs and duties are covered, um, and then marking it up from there to get the retail price. So again, I know this is kind of just touching on all these topics, um, just to cover up um, what I'll be going through in upcoming sessions. Um, the next one, which I think is not for a few weeks, but we'll really be diving into um, market preparation and defining your target audience, You know, asking yourself what questions to ask yourself to figure out who your customer is and you know, what retailers to target. Um, we'll also move into um, sales strategies, so brand positioning and messaging, um, finding your unique selling proposition and planning for market. You know, what collateral do you need? Creating lookbooks and line sheets, and I'll have examples of some really beautiful ones that um, I like to reference. Um, for you and then finally presenting your brand this is what everybody wants to know is where and how to communicate with your buyers and customers um, and really you know how do you tell your brand story um, so we'll definitely be diving into a lot more detail um, in upcoming sessions which hopefully will be helpful for you um, so with that i think we have some time um, for any questions and answers um, that anybody might have we have a whole bunch of questions. Probably to open you. my chat. Okay. <laughs> it's different. It's on a different platform. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't do a good job of explaining that to everyone. So anyway, um, so I'm going to be your narrator for everyone. We have a lot okay. of questions because I know, I know, I kind of like rushed through everything, but yeah. <laughs> and also, it's very early. Um, just like for many of you that are on the other side of the globe, it is earlier for you. So thank you for joining us. Some, some oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but I have a question myself personally. So this sure. past market, right? Because you were in the US market for you know New York now, which would be a major show that used to be across four, four levels. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in September, US buyers still couldn't go um, and travel. And I know you had a lot of appointments booked uh, from different people. And I'm curious now, how did that work with like a let's say a net a porte? Because they couldn't travel, right? Yeah, so there are two different things, really. So the trade shows were really, you know, I know it was always like New York Now, for example, specifically to reference it, it was a very international show. You know, buyers come in from all over and exhibitors come in from all over, and it was very US focused. Um, US buyers did come in from all over the US, um, more from the West Coast than I thought. Um, which was surprising. Um, I thought it would be more local, you know, East Coast, easy to get to, um, but a lot did come in from the West Coast. Um, so, you know, it was great to see people in person, but for international buyers, it's definitely all still virtual. Um, so dealing with Net-A-Porter, we still have our Zoom appointments um, and, you know, schedule the Zoom appointment, show the collection. Um, well, you know, when I get into, I think it'll be in my last one, presenting your brand and communicating with buyers. Um, I'll walk you through how you deal with um, virtual appointments and how do you show your product with something like jewelry, as you can tell, you know, it kind of looks beautiful from a distance, but you can't really tell, like you can tell in person and hold it and touch it and feel it. So it's a, how do you get that across um, virtually? Sorry, everyone is also asking right now, I'm putting this up so everyone can read. Um, on the She Trades Global Dubai uh, Convert platform, um, we have the whole entire schedule. 
we will be moving it so we, you can see the names of everyone, but we have this in order. So that way then um, those of you that are um, part of She Trades Global Dubai that are outside of the countries, you will still be able to take Britta's webinars. Um, and everything that says webinar is open to everyone. The workshop and mentoring is only for uh, the designated countries. Sorry, I'm just getting a lot of questions about that. Yeah, no, that's I, good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I don't think my next sessions happen for a few weeks. So, um, you know, just keep in touch with the schedule. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's very interesting, and I know you're going to get into this. So, I, I'm just going to throw the questions out there, and then you know, I know you're going to be discussing this in the upcoming sessions. Sure. Um, we're getting questions. Uh, you know, basically from uh, Ms. Zulu, um, she was saying, you know, how do you do a trunk show? I'm having people ask, um, you know, different pricing tiers, different pricing profit margins. I'm not sure if you want to get into these answers now, um, or do you want to save these for each of the sessions? Um, yeah, I mean, just briefly, I can touch on it. Um, so for a trunk show, I'm not sure if this is um, a client you work with currently or somebody that wants to test you to do a trunk show. So I'm actually with the George Center I work with um, uh, had reached out to a bunch of new stores and one of them was like, oh, we love your jewelry. We want to test you out. Let's do a trunk show. So we're actually doing a trunk show with them in a few weeks. Um, and you know, I had a call with them to, you know, go through everything and work out the details. And I asked them, I was like, I said, you know, for trunk shows, normally you would go and, you know, be there to present your product, especially if it's a store that you're just testing out your product with, because you want, obviously want to make sure it sells so that they invest in you going forward. Um, but I asked, you know, given the past year, you know, how are you handling trunk shows? Are you doing in person? A lot of stores are open and customers are coming in, but they're still keeping it, um, you know, maybe it's by appointment or they're limiting number in the store at one time. Um, and the store said that, you know, obviously given the past year, they understand everything. If you can't travel or if um, you're not comfortable to travel yet, they're happy to do the trunk show, just do a, a Zoom training with their staff beforehand, which is what we're going to do because um, the store's on the West Coast. Um, so we're gonna send you know a really nice package um and i can get into the details of like how how to do that and pricing and everything um in the future but we'll send a package we'll do a zoom training to you know introduce everybody to the collection give some selling points um things like that um and then it will be up to the store to really sell the product and bring their customers in and trunk shows are a great so I hope that that's entry. Entry. oh can you hear me Oh, yeah, yeah. Trunk shows are a fantastic way to test because it, it's not only the store testing you to see if you're right for their customer, but you, you can test the store to see how they are as well. You know, ideally, a retailer will be proactive in calling their clients and bringing them in and showing them your product. Um, you know, I've been to many trunk shows where they don't do that. So some of the bigger brand stores, which I won't mention, but um, small boutiques are really great to do that with. And I'm so glad to hear you talk about small boutiques because they are such a huge opportunity, correct? I mean, oh yeah, such a huge opportunity. And, you know, I have a small boutique I work with on the West Coast and they buy two silhouettes from us, but we offer it in a really broad range of colors, but they just keep selling it and selling it and reordering and reordering. And they don't buy into the new collections unless it's like a silhouette that's similar. Um, but it's great. They keep selling like every other month they get a reorder. Um, so it's great. So, you know, don't discount these smaller stores. Um, this is very important that, you know, you might not get, this is actually something else that I should bring up, which I can bring up in the future too, is about minimum orders. Um, I know a lot of people go into trade shows, you know, expecting to have um, a store order a certain amount from them. Um, you know, depending on your price point, it could be like, you know, I want $5,000. Um, but that's kind of not really happening anymore. You have to really be flexible. And if a store can't afford it because their budgets are still tight, then you really have to um, you know, take that into account and don't discount the store that maybe they can only buy $2,000 from you. It's a start. And if they sell well, they will come back and buy more. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. This is something that I'm going to go back to the questions. Um, Britta, how long does it take you to prepare to go into a new market? 
see, this is why my webinars go over so long. And I'm like, we'll talk about in the future. We'll talk about in the future because there's so much that you need to do to prepare. It's not just like, okay, I'm going to reach out the stores now. Um, the research involved, um, building your collections, building your pricing, like these are so important to really just kind of take the time out and focus on before you even reach out to a store. Um, so, you know, if you're showing a collection, say you're showing a collection now for spring, summer 22, um, preparation starts, you know, a year prior, um, at least in designing and building the collection and then pricing and then photography and building a lookbook, building a line sheet. What's the story? Um, how does it tie into your brand story when you're launching it? Um, there's really so much that goes into it. And then who are you going to target with it? You know, who, who are the stores you want to target? You have to make sure you're reaching stores that are right for your brand. So it really takes time to go through that, you know, Instagram is a great tool. I use it all the time and we'll get into this um, in a future session. Um, you know, how do you reach your buyers? Um, Instagram is probably the number one way right now to reach your buyers, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get their email. So you then have to go online and search and, you know, use LinkedIn as a resource. Um, so it can be very time consuming, but it is worth it in the end. Now you have answered Sarah's question. I'm going to ask the other part of it. I know the answer, but I'll let you. Um, would you <laughs> recommend for research you should hire someone, hire a consultant, or do it oneself? I recommend to do it yourself because you know your brand the best. You know, if you do, uh, if you're busy and you want to hire a consultant, um, you can, but you have to be very, very involved. Um, nobody knows your brand better than you. Um, so especially at the beginning, like if you're really just starting to access the international market, um, really take control of that and do it yourself. And oh, we're going to get into a lot of this. I'm actually afraid to answer this. Tad. People are really asking now, um, and I'm going to touch upon, I'm going to do a little bit about pricing tomorrow, not to the extent that you would, I we're having a session, but people are asking the, the gap between pricing on your website and then a retailer who carries your product. This is a very big issue that many of us battle. Um, you know, in a lot of our local markets, we cannot charge mm -hmm. prices that we would internationally. Um, so we'll really touch upon that. But mostly, most real re um, retailers, I cannot speak for really? longer, um, would be a 10 to 15% difference, right? Usually. If yeah. So this is what the landed pricing involves, um, which is kind of the way to work around it. Um, you know, I know it's hard when you're building a website to have a local pricing structure versus international pricing structure, but if you can get, you know, all the different um, uh, currency values on your website, that will help so that, you know, I know I shop internationally, um, that if I'm buying something from the UK, that my price in USD is different than um, in pounds, uh, you know, I just know that my price is going to be different. So that is kind of one way to work around it. Um, and I think most people know that for international, the pricing structure is going to be different just because of shipping costs. And shipping right now is a big, big issue because it's a challenge and it's getting very expensive. Um, so I think consumers understand that. And then, um, oh, yes. Sorry, just someone saying they are based in um, South Africa and they're doing markets and trade shows. It's it's been very different um, than um, than than what it would be doing in person. But that's an, I just really want to go to that because a lot of us here I think it's very important that we're aware. You know, I think people like you said. I just want to go back to that statement. You will not make a million dollars your first trade show. You won't. You won't. <laughs> sorry. I mean. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I went very to, direct there enough. <laughs> yeah, you, no, it's true. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with new designers and they take them to their first trade show and they expect that they're going to make a million dollars and it's just not going to happen. You know, it still takes time. You know, I said that, you know, retailers are looking for new brands and willing to test new brands. Um, but sometimes it it's not right away. It's not immediate. Um, you know, if they really fall in love with your product, that's great. Um, but sometimes it takes two or three um, visits to get them to, you know, take you on. So it, it's really 
hard and challenging. I completely understand that because trade shows are very expensive and you put all that money into it um, and you want to try to at least recoup it. Um, you know, I went to Couture, which is the, the big fine jewelry trade show. And the designer says that she went in without any expectations because um, obviously given the year, we're not sure what to expect, but it is a very expensive show. Um, and we at least recouped the cost, um, which is, I was so pleased with. Um, but I think in the end, she was a little bit unhappy that she didn't do more. Um, but you just have to understand that these are different times. Um, you know, it's trade shows are a bit of a risk right now because yes, you can get the people that are coming and they can see you and they're more apt to buy, but it's also not a guarantee because you don't know how many people are coming. Um, so it, you know, it's a calculated risk. And I think also so people don't realize when you're saying the market research part and really going in and learning, there's different trade shows for different markets that oh, there's so many different trade shows. And it really is a matter of looking at, you know, who's your customer? Um, what are the what's the, your price point? You know, if you're um, a low price point brand and you're trying to reach Net-a-Porte, they're never going to buy from you because they have certain price point thresholds. Um, so you really have to look at your brand critically and see how do you fit into these different retailers? Um, does your brand fit in? Um, and I don't mean design-wise necessarily, but yes, you want to have an aesthetic, but you also want to stand out and not look like everybody else. But you know, price point-wise, customer-wise, um, are you all aligned on all of the different channels? It's really important to kind of take that into account before you start outreach because you know, you might get discouraged if nobody starts buying from you, but you could be just reaching the wrong stores. And we'll discuss a lot of that about buyer outreach and how that is done. And you actually don't need a trade show. You can do it. You don't, honestly, you can do it, especially because, um, you know, a lot of buyers still still aren't traveling, especially internationally um, and are taking Zoom appointments. So um, there's there are many ways, which I'll get into. Um, I think my last session is really going to focus on that. Um, you know, how to talk to buyers, how to set yourself up to communicate with them virtually. And I, I think this is very interesting because uh, Nicola is asking, you know, would the 50% profit margin apply between, you know, high and low ticket items? And I think it's important to understand that each, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. I'm going to put it to where I'm just going to kind of show like OTB. Yeah other stuff like open a buys and just kind of show that that process but each retailer has set margins that they're responsible for so each buyer yeah. is required to have a certain margin when Britain and I first started in jewelry it was 50 percent um and then you know then it would have been for handbags at the time 62 percent at most for clothing it would be 67 Clothing now on average is 71%. And this is more of just like, uh, sorry, contemporary price point to luxury, which we'll get in those different market segments. Um, but think about that, everyone. The buyer, so between like what you're, like you're getting paid, but then the buyer is getting 67% or more of the profit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, you know, and they pretty much want that standard across all the target items. But for yourself, as a as you're doing your wholesale pricing, you have to look at the end part of it, right, Britta? You can't just say, "Oh, it cost me five hundred dollars to make it." Well, if, like you said, if you don't know, didn't do a proper, concise assortment planning, yeah, mm -hmm. five hundred to you, yeah, but maybe someone else is only going to pay a hundred for that, correct? Exactly. Yeah, that's where our perceived value um, comes into play. You know, really take a look at what somebody going to pay for your product. You know, I. This is what I do with the brands I work with now. Um, I do a lot of pricing and, you know, always start out with the cost, do your markups from there. Um, I generally do, again, this is jewelry, but um, I do up the highest. So I do like a 2.5, see where that gets me, um, cost to wholesale. And then again, 2.5 um, wholesale to retail, see where that gets me. And then kind of see where that lands. I you know, does this piece look that price or can I play around with it and kind of like back out from it from there. Um, another exercise we like to do is, you know, just lay your products out on a table and take sticky notes and write what you think 
the retail value would be and stick it down and kind of see like, okay, do these align with each other? Does this make sense? Would I buy this at that price? Um, because you really do have to think about your end consumer, but you also have to be cognizant of what you're getting and what your profit margin is. Um, so it's kind of pieces of a puzzle that you have to put together. And you know, at all times, your bread and butter, let's say, you know, uh, your earrings, right? That's, I, I won't say the designer's name, but the one, one of your major clients, you yeah. know, like basically your bread and butter pieces and your statement earrings what the prices always have to be no matter what right yeah i mean again this goes into um when you're doing your assortment planning um as i mentioned like looking at past seasons best sellers you know did something sell really well could have been um price related you know what price point sold really well um and make sure that you're filling that niche and that things are filling that target um you know, I know that earrings between a thousand and twenty three hundred sell really well for the brand that I work with. Um, we all want to be so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So it's a matter of making sure you're filling in those um, gaps. And like I said, like your core pieces, you really need to make sure you're you have a good profit margin on your core pieces because that's really where you'll make money because you're selling them all the time. Your one of a kind pieces, you know, if you want to take a little bit of a less margin because it might be a harder sale, um, then that's where that you, fluctuation comes into play. And just so everyone's aware, because we're coming at this as a full picture. Um, so you're going to really see when we're working with Avon, it's very focused on the inspiration. It's very focused on the design side assortment building i when i speak to you is very business um, focused and britta is the blend between and really from you know the d to c and the b to b part of it so we're really going to be giving you the three you know main sides of how you design and how you are very successful in the business a lot of people just think i design it and i throw it out there and that's how it works and yeah design it's not like that easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's not that we're, easy. We're some creams today, but <laughs> no. yeah, no, no. It's, it's the creativity side is is very important, but the other components like the market research, and that's why you know we really stress that you know you don't just have your employees do these things. It's you as the business owners, right? Really need to be involved yeah. in everything in order for this absolutely. To be and we found that people that apply this approach, because you know we're very blessed, we all have different backgrounds and are all bringing it together and know what works. You really then are getting insights into all different avenues of the business. Now tomorrow I'm gonna to talk a little bit, um, it's, I'm talking about pricing structures, but it's more so about understanding ranges. I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of the market so you can kind of see now what Britta is saying, but I'm gonna put it more into some practicalities tomorrow morning and it's still more of an overview. Um, and that is tomorrow at 10 o'clock Paris time. Then we have, uh, right after me, we have Gregory Sampson. He is, oh no, oh my God, sorry, Sunny Delon. How could I forget Sunny? Yeah, I was like, wait, Sunny. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> he is going to give us, we've had a lot of interest um, um, from, you know, internationally. It's an amazing, really cool time with, with the um, sourcing opportunities and really cool textiles and the history of all the different countries um, in on, on the continent of Africa. And he's really going to go through just kind of an introduction of the history. A lot of us gain a lot of inspiration from different regions. And I think there's also a lot of confusion about um, the different types of aesthetics and different types of materials uh, of each region of Africa. So he's really going to focus on that tomorrow and it'll be really exciting. He's right after me. Then we have Gregory Sampson. He's going to be showing us basically a free platform. I'm obsessed with it. Um, best thing that I ever learned about. Um, it is basically a free platform called T4SD. And he's really going to show us how we can actually have transparency in our supply chain. Um, I think we're all saying now trust is a very big thing. This platform is free and will allow us to use it so we can actually have all of our suppliers. And um, you can actually really map and show a buyer this is your supply chain. So it's really, really cool. And in the afternoon, we're really lucky to have Selena from Chateau Jewels and Nizarim from um, Aliana Jewels. They are uh, really strong uh, jewelry designers from Lebanon that really um, are going to tell their practical experience of what's been going on. They, they've really mastered this 
um, understanding how to do, you know, the, the net a forte treatment that we were talking about today, how do you actually navigate everything that's happening and, you know, trying to basically su succeed during, you know, some really crazy times and really great lessons to learn, especially from Lebanon, where they have really been through severe currency fluctuations, really great lessons will come from that. So I'm really excited for that tomorrow. So we have a lot going on. Um, you know, we will be a lot of everyone's been talking about upcycling, which is like my favorite thing. The, the fact that we're seeing more of that is just getting more and more exciting. And I think you all can see we all have, we're all kind of saying the same themes that you need to implement. So no matter what side of your business, the full circle of it, um, you know, these key themes come keep coming out. So we're really going to make sure you're able to do that. One thing I totally forgot to talk about, I cannot believe it this morning. I must have needed my coffee, drop ship. <laughs> So I'm going to bring, um, bring, discuss about dropship. It's a big trend that we've been seeing a lot, not particularly in jewelry, but um, outside of any other key categories, particularly if you are in handcrafted or um, handmade type items. We're seeing a lot of that as well, too, about dropship. So I'll bring it up. I cannot believe I forgot to talk about that this morning. Um, I have taken screenshots of all the questions. Anything we didn't get to, really want to bring that up. Um, you know, everyone, again, is asking the times. The link is in the chat, but basically the Road to She Trades Global, um, it will kick off again tomorrow, 10 a.m. Paris time, and we'll go throughout the day. We'll have pretty much the same schedule that we had today. And again, any questions that you're thinking of, please put in the chat. We will be announcing more webinars. Now, I now know I there are certain webinars I wanted to do, but I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page by a lot of the questions that are asking. Jeff, I'm gonna do determining a market segment that's coming up, um, understanding consumer behavior, Britta is really going to focus on that research part, and we may even do a second session on that, on basically how you really research your customers. Before um, I, I let Britta go, and everyone, I really want to thank everyone. I have really have enjoyed everyone being so interactive. I've really enjoyed, um, you know, meeting everyone. Please continue to keep, you know, posting with your company names. That really helps me get to know you as well. We all need to start getting to know each other even more and I'm really excited for you that you've taken this journey. Um, you know, She Trades Global is an amazing platform as well. And She Trades Accelerator program is really going to help um, you know, the six countries are working with really forge alliances together and really, you know, provide you with the most up-to-date information. Um, Britt, I may pick your brain more about the current market. I'm gonna make you talk later about that even more. So sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was happy. And I thank you, Britta. Um, I know, again, it was very early for you today. So thank you for that. And I know you're very busy with market, just like everyone else in this call. Everyone's extremely busy. So I thank everyone for taking the time today. And it was lovely meeting everyone. And I think that is it. Is there anyone from the She Trades team that needs to say anything? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow at, we start right at 10 o'clock. Um, tomorrow there will not be an intro, so we're just going to get right into it at 10.